So thank you everyone for, for joining today. Um, uh, welcome to the Office of the Chief Scientists uh, seminar series. I'm, I'm Andrew Paul, Senior Science Advisor with the OCS, and I'll be your host for uh, this term's seminars. Uh, on behalf of the entire OCS, we welcome you to the second um, seminar of, of this year. And uh, today we are going to be recording the seminar. Um, recordings from previous seminars are also available, as will this one, uh, and they're available on the Alberta Environment and Protected Areas YouTube page. So if you have colleagues that were unable to attend today, or if you'd like to go back and see this presentation again, you're, uh, you'll be able to find those on on that YouTube page. Uh, given that we're broadcasting today um, right across Alberta uh, to, to, to many folks, I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the lands and gathering places um, for treaties four, six, seven, eight, and 10, and homeland of the Métis peoples as well. Um, this includes traditional ter territory of the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Soto nations, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures influence our communities uh, today. So wherever you find yourself, I encourage you to recognize acknowledge, and acknowledge a relationship that uh, First Nations, Inuit, uh, Métis have with the lands where you live, uh, work, and learn. So to maintain our qual call quality today, we're going to turn off everyone's video and audio, so that's been disabled. Um, but if you have questions or comments at any time, you know, during the uh, presentation, just enter them into the into the chat box. Uh, and once um, Dr. Bork's presentation is concluded, I'll read out those questions in the order they received um, for for Dr. Bork to respond to. So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Edward Bork, uh, who's from the University of Alberta. And today he'll be presenting on the potential beneficial role of livestock grazing in enhancing grassland carbon stocks. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Dr. Bork is a professor of rangeland ecology and management and director of the Rangeland Research Institute at the University of Alberta. He's been teaching and conducting range research for more than 25 years on a wide variety of basic and applied topics, including uh, integrated weed control and pastures, grazing systems, fire ecology, forage agronomy, landscape production dynamics, wildlife livestock integration, and agroforestry. Most recently, he's been leading studies examining the role of grasslands and cattle grazing and providing alternative environmental goods and services such as carbon storage, greenhouse gas reduction, and biodiversity retention. Uh, he and his students have given many technology transfer talks over the last several decades. Uh, so with that, Dr. Bork, I'll turn it over to yourself and I guess Kristen, who's going to walk through the slides for you. <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for hosting. And I think the star of the show is going to be Kirsten, given that I think she's got probably the most difficult job of all. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to just acknowledge is <clears throat> that what I'm going to be presenting today is really the results of a lot of teamwork with a, involving a lot of people, a small army of scientists, uh, postgraduate fellows and uh, graduate students and undergrads. A lot of people have done work on this over the last 12 to 15 years. So I just want to recognize that there's a lot of people involved in this particular work. Next slide. OK, I, I want to start out with just a, an overview of the overarching research objectives, basically around the time when we started this work, which was in 2012. And I want to especially recognize the Alberta Livestock and Meat Agency, who, despite what, what their name sake suggests, uh, they actually had the vision to support research into ec ecological goods and services. And this was the re first real thrust in, in, into this, th this area. We had the following objectives. Really, the first and foremost was to quantify the size and stability of carbon stores in northern temperate grasslands. We knew it was large, but we didn't realize just how large it was. And we want to also understand the contribution of the different ecosystem components. So whether it's live vegetation or roots and, and versus shoots and, and soil organic carbon and so on, we wanted to understand where was that carbon located. And then equally important to that, we wanted to understand how grazing, since grazing is really a predominant land use across most of these grasslands, to understand whether grazing increases or decreases carbon, including providing some kind of predictive framework on understanding where and when land managers, so ranchers or livestock producers, might be able to adjust their management to trigger an increase in soil carbon. 
And the long-term goal is really to provide an empirical foundation that can be reused by policymakers and uh, and other NGOs for rewarding ranchers and grass farmers for carbon storage. So that that's where we really want to be. And I think we've made a lot of progress and hopefully I will be convincing you of that as well. Next slide. Okay, so we've done a lot of studies. Some of them are fairly small. Some of them are really broad studies. There's three larger research programs that I'm going to kind of hone in on. The, the first one is what I call the benchmarking study, which was really done at over 100 sites in Alberta. And it included a comparison of the carbon stock, in essence, in, in soils and vegetation components within paired, grazed, and non-grazed areas. Some of you might know this as the rangeland reference area program that the Alberta government um, is, is basically monitoring and looking after for many, many decades. And so we did that from 2012 to 2015. We also came into possession of a, a complementary data set from Saskatchewan. This is from the former PFRA pastures. They had gone out and collected a number of soil cores and they had collected, they'd assessed the soil carbon on it, but no one had done anything with it. And so we set up a data sharing agreement. We were able to get that. And there's some interesting results that came out of that as well. And then we've also done a lot of work on the specific impact of, of adaptive multi-paddock or AMP rotational grazing. And that work has been done in several, uh, all of the prairie provinces, basically from 2016 to 21. So I'm going to take all of that information and kind of mash it together in, into some of these results. Next slide. Okay, so the first question is just how big are the carbon stock sizes and what is the effect of land use conversion? So land use change effects. So across the more than 100 sites in Alberta, um, our native grasslands contain over 90 tons of carbon per hectare on average. So on average, but that's averaged out over more than 100 sites. And this is a conservative estimate of the soil carbon stock because this includes all of the vegetation above ground, the litter layer, um, and also this, the relatively shallow soil carbon down to 30 centimeters. It does not include the deeper soil carbon. And we know there's a lot of carbon below 30 centimeters and that's not included here because we simply couldn't go into these exposures and collect the cores that were that deep. Having said that, there's also a large range in soil carbon stocks among the different regions. For example, in southeastern Alberta, in the mixed grass prairie, we're looking at about 50, 50 to 60 tons of carbon per hectare on average. Whereas when you get into the higher rainfall environments, such as the foothills and montane regions of southwestern Alberta, not uncommon to have 150 or 180 tons or even higher, close to 200 tons of carbon per hectare. The other thing to point out is, as you can see in the graph on the right side here, at a number of these locations, we had paired studies set up so we could compare native grassland to either introduced forage, so areas that had once been cropped and planted back down to tame forage, or were still being managed under a cropland regime. And by and large, our native systems had upwards of 30 to 35 percent more carbon. And that's pretty consistent with what we see in global studies. I also want to give special recognition to the fact that an, a very much underreported component of the soil carbon stock or the ecosystem carbon stock was in the mulch layer. Uh, the foresters will talk about this as the litter fiber cumic or LFH layer. This is at the surface of the, of the mineral soil and represents the area where litter is degrading and being integrated into the soil. We had as much as 15 tons of carbon per hectare just in that layer alone. Next slide. Okay, I, I just want to maybe compare how these results compare globally, because even though I, I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about how grazing can be used to tinker with soil carbon stocks, the reality is the most important way that land managers have to retain and improve carbon is to make sure that they maintain existing perennial grasslands. In other words, don't cultivate them. The, the reduction in soil carbon that we observed with cultivation or land use conversion is consistent with other studies worldwide, which show 30 to 55% declines in soil carbon. This is an example from here in Alberta, Whalen and all 2003, where you can see there's anywhere from a 20 to 30% reduction in soil carbon concentration in the foothills fescue, that's at the Staveley Research Station, and in the mixed grass uh, prairie in southeastern Alberta, anywhere from a 30 to 40% reduction in soil carbon. So really important to maintain the existing grasslands that we have first and foremost, because they represent the greatest carbon stock. Next slide. <clears throat> 
OK, uh, a much more nuanced question that we had is what's the effect of grazing itself? Keeping in mind that across these benchmarking sites in Alberta, over 100 locations, we had a, a paired comparison set up of a long term area without grazing compared to with grazing outside. Across those uh, 106 grasslands covering six different natural subregions, we actually found 12% higher soil carbon stock within the grazed areas. And most of that increase was in the topsoil. So the top six inches are 15 centimeters. And this is, this is important because that represents the most active uh, area of, of biological uh, interface, if you like, with what's going on above ground directly due to the herbivores. And of course, that's the largest input of a plant root biomass. So 12% increase. Next slide. Now, the, the next question that we really wanted to get at is, is there a framework that we can use to understand how and why grazing increases soil carbon? And this goes to that predictability component. We wanna be able to predict how grazing can be utilized to increase soil carbon, because that would be then, it would lead to the identification of best management practices that, that, that ranchers and grazers can actually implement. Next slide. Okay, so there's there's a number of things that come up. I'm not going to touch on all of them, but I'm going to touch on many of them. So the first thing is that grazing clearly alters plant community composition. One of the big changes that we saw associated across the benchmark sites in Alberta is that grazing typically increased plant diversity. You can see that in the graph on the right side that basically in most of the regions, the only exception perhaps being the dry mixed grass prairie, we generally see a grazing induced increase in the total pool or the richness of, of plant species associated with the, the grazed environments. And much of this diversity boost, the, the increase in plant richness was associated with a, a lot of dicot, so a lot of broadly flowering plants. And in other cases, it was associated with a shift towards grazing tolerant species. And many of those were exotic, so introduced plant species that may be naturalizing across these landscapes. Uh, next slide. Okay, so one of the things that we did do is we wanted to understand whether this grazing induced shift towards an increase in the abundance of broadleaf dicot, so flowering plants, could actually be, be responsible for part of the soil carbon increase. So this is a structural equation model and it's been published just, just last year. And it looks complicated, but really it's not. And if I had my pointer, I would basically be able to, to tie this in, but it's, it's called a path analysis because it's essentially looking at trying to trace the effects of grazing, which you can see on the left side, all the way over to what's going on with soil organic carbon on the right side. And the bottom line is based on this path analysis or structural equation model, there were two pathways that really emerged. The first one is that grazing increases the abundance, so the biomass of broadleaf dicots or forbs. And that directly increases the pool of litter carbon mass. So litter is that dead and decomposing material on the surface of the soil. And that in turn directly increases soil organic carbon. Ironically, the path through the graminoids, so the grasses and sedges, was not significant. It wasn't the amount of graminoids, even though that tends to be the largest pool of biomass. It's the biomass of the forbs that seem to be driving much of the soil organic carbon increase. The second pathway was through the quality of that litter, so the quality of the biomass. And the way we, the way we assess quality was through the carbon to nitrogen ratio. But this path actually reflected the opposite pattern of the forbs and graminoids. So instead of the forb quality being important, it was actually the carbon to nitrogen ratio of the graminoids. And so the way this path worked is that grazing or the presence of grazing essentially lowered the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is an enhancement in the quality or decomposability of that litter, which led to an increase in litter carbon mass, which in turn triggered the increase in soil organic carbon. So two pathways, both contribute to soil organic carbon increases under long-term exposure to grazing. Next slide. Okay, why is this important? Well, because when we, when we look at the data and we parse it a little bit further, we were able to, and we saw this consistently, and I'll show you several examples of it, that soil carbon was generally positively associated with 
the proportional presence of introduced plant species. So grasslands that had a lot of introduced plant species, plants that are, are non-native to this region, but had moved in from Europe or Eurasia, tended to accumulate a lot more carbon. It included some of them are, are weedy species, some of them are nuisance weed, but many of them are agronomics and naturalized. And this response was independent of grazing. So the two lines that you can see here in the graph, carbon in the top 15 centimeters was increasing as the proportion of introduced diversity increased. And that's across the Alberta sites again. Next slide. When we looked at the Saskatchewan uh, data set that we got our hands on, we again saw a very similar dynamic in that long-term cattle stocking information um, provided a positive relationship where when we when we dug down into those Saskatchewan study sites, which were distributed across a fairly wide gradient of mixed grass prairie, that soil carbon mass generally increased. And once again, in the top 15 centimeters of soil, as long term normalized stocking rates increased. So seems to be a very consistent effect in Alberta and Saskatchewan, where grazing is consistently boosting the, the top soil carbon content. Next slide. Um, another interesting nugget that we were able to glean from the Saskatchewan data is that when we dug down into the specific effect of different plant species associated with the uh, Saskatchewan data, we found that much of the carbon increase in the topsoil was very closely tied to one specific introduced plant species, which is Kentucky bluegrass or Poa pretensis. And this was a completely unexpected result, but ironically, has also been reported in other regions. For example, Matt Sanderson and his research group in the Dakotas have found a very similar effect. So it raises an interesting question. Could the bluegrass be increasing carbon because of its simple contribution to plant diversity? Or is it the added production due to biomass addition? Or is it due to changes in biochemical cycling? And I'm gonna show you some evidence shortly that, that suggests it's biogeochemical cycling, at least in part. Next slide. So one of the one of the companion things that we've been doing through all of this work is looking at rates of litter decay or turnover. So the, the curves on the right hand side here are basically litter decay curves and shows the effect of litter decomposition over time. And what we found is that the microclimate associated with grazed grasslands outside of our exclosures, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> was generally conducive to leading to greater rates of litter decay. So whether it's because of the increase in urine or the, the fecal matter that's out there or the direct trampling effect of livestock, for whatever reason, there appears to be greater litter decomposition happening within the grasslands exposed to chronic grazing. The other thing that we found is Kentucky bluegrass showed up again because we did some interspecific comparisons of different grasses in terms of their decomposability. And that graph is shown here in the lower left. And among the, the four grasses we tested, three of them were native, one of them was the bluegrass, and the bluegrass actually decomposed the fastest. So when you look at the different decay curves, you can see that bluegrass was actually breaking down the quickest. And in part, it was due to particularly larger effects of what we call extracellular enzyme activity responsible for carbon and nitrogen breakdown. Next slide. Okay, I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the talk talking about adaptive multi-paddock rotational grazing. So in Western Canada, somewhere around anywhere from about half all the way up to close to three quarters of grazers use some form of rotational grazing. However, the minority of these rotational grazers are using something called AMP grazing. So AMP grazing is a specialized kind of rotational system in which we take a large land area, break it up into much, much smaller paddocks, and then stock the animals within those paddocks at very high densities. We do that in order to try to attain more uniform forage use because there's more competition among animals. Well, and then because those animals are staying in there for a very short period of time, sometimes as short as 12 to 24 hours or maybe 48 hours, when they move out of there, there's usually a very long recovery period after that. 
And that lengthy recovery period is critical to allow those plants to rebuild leaf area, rebuild root mass, rebuild their meristematic tissues, and to get themselves ready into a physiological state that they can handle defoliation once again. So that lengthy recovery period is really important. AMP grazing is known as a lot of things, uh, holistic, regenerative, management intensive, mob grazing, high intensity, low frequency is what I've called it in the past as well. But all of these are derivations of, of that AMP grazing. Next slide. Okay, so that particular study started in 2016. It was done on farm in collaboration with, with livestock producers across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. We had 32 different pairs. So we identified the AMP grazers and then we identified a neighboring property in which we on equivalent ecosites, so similar soil conditions, topographic positions and climate so that we could then compare and isolate the effect of the, the grazing regime itself. All of these areas had to have been managed under a fairly stable regime for at least 10 years and many of them had been 20 years or longer. They represent a broad coverage of soil and climatic zones. And then we evaluated a whole bunch of different responses. Everything from what are the management actions that are being taken? What's the forage production and use? What's the water infiltration rates, uh, uh, the water infiltration rates like within those areas? What's the carbon storage and the greenhouse gas fluxes, microbial abundance and so on. So I'm gonna touch on all of these things, but only very briefly because of time constraints. So if you ever want more information on any of these areas, I'm, I'm happy to get back to any of you. Okay, next slide. Okay, question one, what are the core management differences that exist between the AMP producers that were initially recognized from our recruitment survey, if you like, and the, the neighboring operations? And I like to think of the neighbors as a grab bag of random beef producers from across the, the prairie provinces. So you got to think of the, the neighboring operators as this random grab bag of producers, whereas the AMP were deliberately selected to look at this very specific management practice of where, when, and how often we graze, followed by that lengthy rest period. Okay, next slide. Okay, a couple of the management metrics I want to touch on. So many AMP producers were always under the impression that they were typically stalking at a higher level. In other words, they had a greater intensity of forage removal. Our results actually did not find that to be the case. In fact, the stalking rates, the average stalking rates between the AMP producers and the neighbors were non-significant. You can see that over on the, on the left side where there, there's no difference. There might be a very small difference, but statistically, we couldn't separate between the two of them. What is different, though, is how they graze. Not how much they graze, but how they graze. And what I mean how they graze, it's the specific use of high stock density because they're basically grazing with a lot more paddocks, confining their animals into these small areas. And so their stock densities were generally more than 20 fold higher than on the neighboring property. So how they graze is really the difference. We also found differences in, because the AMP operators had fine tuned their management so much, they were able to start about three weeks earlier in the year in grazing. Their average start date was around April 25th as opposed to May 17th. And they also stretched out the grazing and into the fall. So they grazed as long as seven months or longer, whereas your typical neighboring operator typically was only grazing for four and a half months. So big differences in, in how, both logistically and temporally, how these lands are being grazed. Okay, next slide. And perhaps the most important thing was how these producers actually strategically utilized rest to favor the, re the recovery period and regeneration of their pastures. So we developed something called a, an RGR, which is a, a rest to grazing ratio. And we've found it to be actually a very useful metric. The RGR is the minimum days of rest after early season grazing and prior to regrazing later in the year. Many producers were very clear indicating that it, their minimum rest period was 45 days or 60 days or 90 days. And in some cases, it was the entire year. So they wouldn't come back till the following grazing season. So when you look at the graph here on the left side, you can see that the AMP producers had a minimum 
RGR of at least six days. So if they grazed for one day, they gave a recovery period of at least six days. And if they grazed for three days, it was at least 18 days. But the vast majority of AMP producers had an RGR of 40 or more. So that means if they're grazing for two days, they're giving basically 80 days of recovery. So for each day of grazing, the number of days of rest. In contrast, the neighboring properties were generally at an RGR of less than six and the vast majority were less than two. So you can see how these, these two different groups differed in terms of how they prioritized the rest period that their vegetation was getting between grazing events. Okay, next slide. Okay, a, a very important question, particularly for the producers, was how does AMP grazing alter grassland production and forage use? And so uh, Dr. Jessica Grenke, she was a PhD student at the time. This was a focus of, of her work. Next slide. And really interesting outcome here. You don't typically see this in science very much, but this is one of those rare cases where it appears that we can actually have our grass and eat it too. Um, in fact, the AMP grazed areas typically produced greater grassland biomass, and that was despite having higher forage utilization rates. This suggests really that there's some potential for compensatory plant growth and therefore compensatory forage growth under these particular regimes. This is maybe not surprising because grasslands on average are dominated by grazing tolerant plants. Most grasses are generally quite grazing tolerant, which means they can generally withstand grazing provided they're, they're given the recovery period or recovery conditions that they need. Uh, across our AMP ranches, the AMP areas were producing somewhere around uh, a little over 3,000 kilograms per hectare, whereas in comparison, the neighbors were producing around 2,500. So that's an increase of maybe 14, 15%. And then at the same time, when we quantified the relative utilization that occurred by midsummer, the AMP operations were around 40%, whereas the neighboring properties were only at 15%. So really unusual and very pleasantly surprised by what we found in, in this area. And of course, uh, biomass production or photosynthesis is the primary means through which carbon is input into these systems. So if you have more carbon, being fixed by plants, that's the essential building block that we have for soil carbon. Next slide. Okay, next question is, does AMP grazing alter water infiltration? So this was uh, this was worked on and published by Tim Dober, who was a postdoctoral researcher um, working on the project. Next slide. And again, the results are, are short and sweet. So we used uh, ring infiltrometers basically pounded into the soil to do infiltrometer tests within these various grasslands. And what we found is that the AMP gray soils generally took up water more readily for plant growth. So basically the water was able to infiltrate uh, quicker. This is really important for a number of reasons. One, because the faster the water you get in the ground, the less you're going to lose due to evaporation or to runoff. And of course, the risk of erosion tends to go down as well if you have a reduced risk of overland flow. So between the two treatments, the AMP grazed uh, pastures basically had 41% higher water infiltration. This is really important in our water limited environments, which many of our grasslands are. So the more water we can capture and retain, the greater the hydrologic function of these grasslands and the more likely we are to make more water available for, for ongoing uh, productivity. Next slide. Okay, we also looked at greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we looked at them both in the field and in, in incubation experiments and I'll explain why we did that. So there's a couple postdocs that basically worked on this component. Next slide. So when we looked at CO2 fluxes in the field, and in fact we didn't really see a strong signal of grazing treatment. So whether AMP grazing or the neighboring properties differed in any of the, the, the greenhouse gas fluxes. By and large, CO2, methane, and nitrous oxide didn't differ in the field, although we have a nagging suspicion that it's due to the very high variability that we see in greenhouse gas readings across these pasture environments. What we did see is that CO2 fluxes in the field increased with total cattle stocking rates. 
And this was particularly apparent in the higher rainfall grasslands of northern Alberta, north central and western Alberta. So if you look at the graph on the right here, you can see that the blue line is generally showing that as stocking rates went up, there was higher CO2 flux, which means that those grasslands are, are losing more carbon through to net respiration or CO2 release, partly due to the vegetation, but also due to the pri primarily the microbial community in the, in the soil. Um, the other thing that we found, because when we set up our management surveys, we did inquire with producers on the long-term history of these grasslands. <coughs> and what we did find is that native grasslands, so grasslands that had never been cultivated in the past, actually had higher uptake potential of methane. So I want to explain that graph on the right side a little further. So if you look at the y-axis scale, you'll see that those are negative values. Negative values are a good thing because it essentially means that the microbial community in the soil, specifically methanotrophs or, meth or methane consuming bacteria are actually taking up methane out of the atmosphere. So grasslands that had never been cultivated as provided information provided by our, our, um, uh, uh, our study participants, the ranchers themselves, basically had a sink strength that was generally about double. So those soils were taking up about twice as much methane as soils that were cultivated in the past, even though they hadn't been cultivated for let's say 20 or 30 years. So they, they, were, they were currently in grasslands, but had a much lower sink strength. So this is important because if you think about the penalty of land use conversion, even if you restore a tame or introduce pasture back into those areas, they are still not going to be the same long term in terms of their ability to take up methane from the atmosphere. Next slide. Okay, well, we also did another complementary component here on the greenhouse gas assessments where we removed soil and brought it into the lab and conducted incubations. Why did we do that? Well, we were worried about the noisy environment out there in the pastures, and it also enabled us to look very specifically at the effect of, let's say, uh, the microenvironment, things like soil moisture and temperature. And what we actually found is that the AMP conditioned soil, and I'm using that word conditioned deliberately, because I tend to think of the grazing treatment in the field as basic priming the mi microbial community. So it's basically building a certain microbial community. And the AMP conditioned soil had greater methane uptake, and this was especially true at high temperatures. So in the graph, you can see that the data on, on the right side at 25 degrees Celsius, you see that there's generally at least a two, if not two and a half fold increase in methane consumption by microbes in the soil. Why is this occurring? Well, we feel we're pretty confident this is due to changes in the microbial community assembly. This is the composition of the different microbes and their activity, including methanotrophs. Next slide. And this leads us to the next question, which is, does AMP grazing alter the soil microbial community? And this was looked at by uh, Dr. Opama uh, Shatri Shateri. And we've, we've actually published a couple papers. There's one in press, but I'm going to show you some really interesting results from that, um, from that work. Next slide. So one of the things that we did see is there are quite pronounced differences between the soils and the microbial communities within the soils between the AMP and the neighboring or conventional properties. So AMP grazing generally reduced the microbial biomass carbon to nitrogen ratio and also decreased the fungal to bacterial ratios. The best way that, that we can interpret this is that AMP likely led to more rapid biogeochemical cycling. So it favored more bacteria, which generally tend to turn over um, the, the carbon and nitrogen much more quickly over time. Next slide. We also, at the same time, recognized and found that AMP grazing actually increased the diversity of fungi. And you can see that on the left side here, but reduced bacterial diversity. So the, these pulses of grazing events followed by long recovery periods where we're basically stalking the animals at high density appear to favor a more complex fungal community, even though it may be lower in abundance. 
Next slide. And perhaps the, the most important component here, and th these results are just in press right now. So uh, Lopama is basically has a paper on microbial community network analysis. So this basically looks at all the different phyla within the soil and then basically looks at the network associations. The bottom line is this, the AMP grazed soils, and again, thinking of AMP grazing as a priming treatment to create a certain environment that would create that microbial community, that microbial community had increased complexity within the microbial network. What does that mean? Well, it means there's greater microbial activity and cooperation among the different taxa. There's more linkages among them. So synergies happening among them. We also found that higher cattle stocking rates increased network complexity as well, although I didn't put that in here, but you can see in the, in the top two, uh, uh, basically path analysis here, you can see that there's that tight clustering of the AMP where there's a lot of shared connections happening. So that, that's associated specifically with that, that specialized type of grazing where we're confining animals into small paddocks and then moving them relatively often with a long recovery period. Next slide. Okay, the, perhaps the most important question is, does AMP grazing alter soil carbon? And if so, how? So we'll go into that next. Next slide. And the answer to that is it does, but again, we found very targeted responses. AMP grazing specifically led to a thicker AH horizon. So that's our humified horizon where we have most of our organic matter accumulating. The, the AMP prime soils after 20 plus years, basically at a thicker AH horizon, and that was also associated with more soil organic carbon mass. However, that effect was most likely to be found at higher stocking rates. So the two graphs here, the one on the left side shows the AH depth. The one on the right side shows the specific soil organic carbon mass. You can see that the AMP generally goes up and to the right for both of them, whereas the NAMP is uh, declining to the, to, to the right. So it means that there is apparently a dependency that AMP grazing is more likely to lead to greater soil organic uh, matter accumulation or carbon accumulation, specifically by building a thicker topsoil, potentially due to that trampling effect and that high turnover of material, but it's more likely to occur at higher stocking rates. And that potentially has something to do with the, the increased uh, plant productivity and the utilization levels that, that we observed. Uh, next slide. Uh, within the AMP study, we had the opportunity to once again look at the relative effect of introduced plants. Same effect that we observed in the Saskatchewan data set, same as the Alberta data set, that soil organic carbon once again increased as the proportional abundance of non-native plant species in increased. Uh, and this, this response, you can see that, that there really wasn't a difference between the AMP grazed areas and the neighboring properties. That generally these introduced plants, once they come into these grasslands, they tend to increase the, uh, the amount of uh, biomass production, the amount of inputs, and therefore soil organic carbon accumulation. And this actually occurred despite a generalized reduction in plant species richness. So that lower graph shows that basically the richness was actually declining. So what does this mean? Well, it means that this very specialized kind of grazing, AMP grazing, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, it leads to a simpler plant community, so less species rich, but that it's often associated with more grazing tolerant and often introduced and more productive plant species, which appears to have this joint effect of elevating soil carbon, possibly due to their high biomass, their unique chemistry, as I pointed out earlier, or potentially their rapid nutrient turnover, like we saw with the Kentucky bluegrass. So there's a whole bunch of, of complex pieces to this puzzle. Next slide. So how does this compare globally? Um, one of the reasons that, that I was really interested in pursuing this question of soil carbon stock is because there really isn't a firm consensus on how soil carbon responds to grazing globally. 
there, there's there's a number of studies that basically suggest that grazing, especially at the the right stalking rate and at the right time of year, can actually increase grazing. So you see Mosier there, Mastery and Bernie all suggested the same thing. But there's other studies, including meta-analyses such as Bai and Quatrufo recently, that basically said, by and large, grazing, no matter where you do it, for the most part, either maintains or generally reduces soil carbon. So this is one of the reasons that we've been very obsessed with trying to get at the specific mechanisms for understanding where, when, and how grazing actually maintains and or increases soil carbon so we can get a better handle on predictability. Next slide. Okay, I wanna finish off with what might be the most important question, which is what's the economic valuation of carbon accrual? And we did publish a paper last year, which actually includes some of that. That's the roll-up data from the Alberta carbon, uh, or the Alberta benchmarking study. And I wanna talk about that next. Next slide. Okay, the way we did this, it's pretty simple actually. We took basically the empirical relationships that we had for each of the natural subregions in Alberta, because we had this, these predictive relationships for, uh, for soil carbon, basically, uh, for each of the natural subregions under both grazed and non-grazed conditions, and then combined that or merged it with the ABMI land use footprint data. So the ABMI data uh, is a, a pretty comprehensive spatial data set for Alberta. And based on that analysis, we basically concluded that there, out of the 3.8 million hectares of grasslands in Alberta, they store somewhere around 360 million tons of carbon. And this is, again, a conservative estimate because we're only looking at what's down to 30 centimeter depth or above that. It's not looking at the carbon below that. And it's including the vegetation and the soil component. When we did this merged analysis, taking our benchmarking data and combining it with the ABMI land use footprint. This basically showed that grazing, which is occurring on more than 95% of the grasslands in the province, is a very widespread land use. We were able to conclude that grazing has increased carbon stock by around 17 million tons relative to non-grazed areas. Another way to thinking about it is if we didn't have any grazing across these lands, these lands might actually store 17 million tons less carbon at present. And at a $50 per ton per CO2 equivalence, this is based on the 2022 valuation that we published, this carbon was worth a little over $3 billion Canadian. Given where carbon valuation is today at $65 a ton, that valuation is actually worth roughly $4 billion. And after April 1st of this year, that number is going to rise to $80 per ton, in which case that value will rise to over $5 billion. So the ecosystem service of carbon storage provided by these grasslands, including the incremental footprint of having grazing on these areas is significant. The one caveat I'll point out is that the Alberta benchmarking sites are all publicly grazed lands with very clear guidelines for light to moderate stocking. So 25 to 50% utilization levels at the highest. So that's an important caveat because by and large, when you go to heavier stocking rates, heavier stocking usually leads to rangeland degradation and a decline in soil carbon stock. So really important, light to moderate stocking for this conclusion. Okay, next slide. Okay, just some key summary points. Hopefully I've been able to convince you that grasslands, they do represent a very large storehouse of biological uh, carbon in Alberta and across Western Canada that is most certainly undervalued by society at present for mitigating atmospheric CO2. Grazing alters grassland composition and nutrient cycling, including uh, litter breakdown in very complex ways that can maintain, and in many cases, increase ecosystem carbon. And that there may be specialized tools such as AMP rotational grazing, they could be used to enhance plant growth and even soil carbon stocks with a number of other benefits such as enhanced water infiltration and so on. And the bottom line is that we need policy changes to really properly value grassland carbon and make sure that we incentivize and or reward ranchers for maintaining and improving these carbon stocks. So that's really where we need to be and we're inching in that direction. Okay, um, last slide. 
I just want to thank uh, the folks from the Alberta government that have been uh, terrific cooperators in this, especially on the Alberta benchmarking side, all the different ranchers that have participated in this work. And, and it's been funded by um, a, a wide variety of groups. I know that there are questions popping up in the chat, so <laughs> let's get to them. Excellent. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Bork. What a wonderful presentation. And uh, I think on behalf of everyone on this call, we uh, uh, thank you for sharing that that work with us. Uh, um, we are running out of time. So with that, uh, Dr. Bork, I would uh, again thank you very much for your uh, for your presentation. We didn't get through all the questions. Um, just to let folks know, we will be um, sharing these questions with with Dr. Bork and I I I, I I offer. I'm guessing it's okay, Dr. Bork, to to, to reach out to um, uh, Dr. Bork directly with with some of these questions. There there's some really great ones in in here, which uh, uh, I, I would have loved to get to if we if we had time. Uh, to everyone that's joining us today, thank you for um, for being here. I just want to let you know that our next science seminar will be Tuesday, February 27th, where we'll be hosting um, Dr. Rolf Inbrook from the University of Alberta. And he'll be presenting on tracking spatial and temporal dynamics of cyanobacterial blooms in Pigeon Lake using Sentinel-2 satellite imagery. So I hope you can join us for that. Uh, I remind folks if they just joined today and are not on the mailing list but would like to see um, what uh, some of the upcoming science seminars are, please send an email to the, um, the Office of the Chief Scientist at aep.ocs at uh, gov.ab.ca, indicating you'd like to be added to the mailing list for these seminars. Uh, and that with that, um, again, Dr. Bork, thank you for sharing that work today. That was uh, a, a fantastic presentation and very informative uh, for all of us. So thank you. And until next time, uh, we'll see folks. Thank you.